Shalom. Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to be talking about some of the doctrines of the Nazarenes. Uh, you can find these doctrines referred to and mentioned in some works by Clement of Rome. And in the uh, Panarian of Epiphanius, you also have the information uh, kind of you know, laid out there by Epiphanius. So, the primary sources for information on the Nazarenes. You know, uh, in the Hebraic Roots movement, a lot of people talk about the Nazarenes, you know, the, the Notsari, the uh, Netzarim in Hebrew, and you know, a lot of people claim that, that they're a Nazarene, that they're a Nazarene follower of Yeshua. But the thing is, is very, very few people actually know what their doctrines were. The general idea that you have presented to you in the Hebraic Roots movement is that the Nazarenes were just, you know, Orthodox Jews who uh, kept all the tenets of the Pharisaical uh, style of Judaism, and the but they just believed in Messiah, and so that's what we think of as, uh, you know, a Nazarene. That's that's kind of the way it's portrayed. So people who are basically just, you know, Messianic Jews. Um, who keep all the the messianic <clears throat> rabbinical Judaism kind of traditions? The, you know they're calling themselves Nazarenes, and the question is: Is that really what the Nazarene faith was like? Is that really the doctrines that they followed? And many people have never actually went back and read any of the documents from the Nazarenes, read any of the historical references, or any of the mentions of them, and and knew what they believed and taught. So we're going to go through some of these uh, doctrines now. Primary sources of information. Uh, one is a work by Epiphanius of Salamis. Um, he was a Epiphanius was a Catholic bishop. Um, he wrote a heresiology called the Panarion. Now, Panarion means medicine chest, and so the what it was is a Panarion was your um, your cures for any heresy that you ran into. So you could. If you ran across this, you know, a, a heresy, you could open up the Panarion and you could see how to refute that heresy. And so Epiphanius, he writes about the groups like the, the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, the uh, Osinaeans, the Edessenes, uh, several other groups, the, the Nazareans. They're all basically the same group. So... Um, you know, Epiphanius d d describes these as being several different groups. However, he also says that they all followed the school of the Nazareans. I think it was all the same group, personally. And I know there's some debate about that. You know, some people think that the Ebionites are separate from the Nazarenes and all this other stuff. I think it was all the same group, or possibly, um, it, you know, in the same way that you could have, like, Protestant Christianity... They all call themselves Christians, but within this group of Christians, there's Methodists and Baptists and, you know, the Church of God and all these other denominations. Uh, I think that the, the term Nazarene is kind of like a blanket term for the entire group. Um, and I'll show you a reference to, uh, to Jerome where he, he describes it similar to that. Uh, also, you can find some of the doctrines of the Nazarenes in a, a couple of works. Uh, one is called The Recognitions of Clement. I usually refer to this document as the Nazarene Acts. And then there's uh, the Clementine Homilies. Now, both of these documents claim to be written by Clement. Um, I have no reason to doubt that Clement at least wrote the, the you know, source document behind these two documents. Um, they uh, are essentially, they're the same story. They're two different versions of the same story. It's like comparing the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. You know, there's differences between them, but they're basically very similar, same narrative, uh, a lot of the same information. Parts of the, the homilies and recognitions are word for word the same, and then parts of them are very different. Um, and I'll put a link in the description of this video so you can download a copy of the recognitions. And you can find the, the Panarion, the recognitions of Clement, the homilies of Clement. You can find all this stuff free on the internet. You can find PDF versions of it pretty easily. Um, 
Also, we have various quotes about a document known as the Gospel of the Hebrews. It's sometimes referred to as the Gospel of the Ebionites. Basically, it is the original Hebrew Matthew. Um, it's, it's mentioned by numerous people. We have Jerome mentions it. Uh, Origen mentions it. Jerome actually uh, claims to have translated it into re uh, Latin at one point. Uh, it's mentioned by Epiphanius. It's mentioned by Augustine. You know, and we we don't have the document anymore. the The gospel, according to the Hebrews, has been lost. But basically, it's very similar to Matthew. Um, <clears throat> but there's stuff that's been taken out of the gospel of the Hebrews, and then what was left, I think, eventually became the the gospel of Matthew. So you can see a lot of the gospel of the Ebionites is still intact in the gospel of Matthew, um, but it has been redacted to get to the, the point that it is now. So we can use references from these historians that quote from the Gospel of the Hebrews to get an understanding of what the Nazarenes believed. And, um, and again, I mentioned this earlier, the Nazarenes are sometimes referred to as different names. The most notable of these is the Ebionites. The Ebionites, it means the poor. Um, so you, you hear that, like James, the brother of Yeshua, he is always associated with the Ebionites. Uh, James, of course, took over the Jerusalem assembly after the ascension of Yeshua. And uh, so James was the head of the whole Yeshua movement from um, the ascension of Yeshua until his death in 62 Common Era. That's why in the book of Acts you always see the people going to James and asking James for decisions, and James was kind of like, the ringleader, um, despite the claim that, that Paul was a ringleader of the Nazarenes, it was actually um, James. James was the one in charge. So, uh, we have this quote from Jerome to a letter, uh, letter to Augustine. Uh, this is known as letter number 75, so if you want to look this up yourself, you can find it that way. Um, and again, J uh, Jerome says, The matter in debate, therefore, or I should rather say your opinion regarding it is summed up in this, that since the preaching of the gospel of Christ, the believing Jews do well in observing the precepts of the law. So the believing Jews is who he's talking about. He's not talking about the Orthodox Jews that reject Yeshua, but the Jews who are believers. He says, uh, as all the Jews have been accustomed to do, so they observe the precepts of the laws all the Jews have been accustomed to do. Uh, if this be true, we fall into the heresy of Serentius and Ebion, who, uh, though believing in Christ, were then anathemized by the fathers for this one error, that they mixed up the ceremonies of the law with the gospel of Christ and professed that their faith in that which was new without letting go of that which was old. Why do I speak of the Abionites, who make pretensions to the name of Christian? Okay, so uh, three things I want to point out here. A, I've already said it, he's talking about believing Jews. He mentions Abion as if Abion was a person. Now, a lot of these Christian historians believe that the reason they were called the Ebionites is because they were founded by a person named Ebion. Um, that's largely regarded to be false. There never was a man named Ebion. It's just something that, they, uh, that these Christian historians presumed, I guess. Uh, so they always talk about how Ebion is in error. Ebion doesn't know what he was talking about, and they, they think that the Ebionites were founded by a person named Ebion. Um, so anyway, but notice that he connects the believing Jews with the Ebionites. And so he goes on to say, In our own day there exists a sect among the Jews throughout all the synagogues in the East, which is called the sects of the Mene, and is even now condemned by the Pharisees. The adherents of this sect are known commonly as Nazarenes. They believe in Christ as the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. They say that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, rose again, is the same as the one in whom we believe, but uh, while they desire to be both Jews and Christians, they are neither the one nor the other. So, um, so again, you see here, Jerome is linking believing Jews to the term Ebionite and Nazarene. So, it appears from what he's saying, the term Ebionite and the term Nazarene refer to the same group of people, not two different sects, as uh, Epiphanius seems to think. So, uh, Epiphanius mentions the travels of Peter. Now, this, here he's talking about 
the, the two documents from Clement that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it says, but the Ebionites used certain other books as well, supposedly the so-called Travels of Peter written by Clement, though they corrupt their contents while leaving a few genuine passages. Clement himself convicts them of this, of this in every way in his general epistles, which are read in the holy churches, because his faith and speech are of a different character than their spurious productions in his name in the travels. He himself teaches celibacy, and they do not accept it. Um, so you know that the, the Catholic Church had this doctrine of, of celibacy. Even married people, they discouraged from having sexual relations. You know, of course, their priests were not allowed to marry and had to live, you know, a vow of chastity. And the same with the nuns. You know, the nuns were not allowed to have, to be married or to have, um, you know, they had to be virgins or whatever. Um, and, and so, and a lot of times in these more Catholic documents, they always portray the apostles as teaching that even the wives are supposed to stop having relations, you know, with their husbands and stuff like that. And I've always maintained that that's a Catholic creation. And you notice that um, Epiphanius, who himself is a Catholic bishop, is saying that the Ebionites reject this whole mess of celibacy. That you know they see that um, Yahuwah created man and woman, and He created them for the purposes of uh, becoming married and and producing offspring uh, through you know sexual relations. That's how you have children. Um, so this teaching of celibacy here, you can tell it, it comes not from the Nazarenes, but it comes from the Catholic Church. So, I, and I will also mention, uh, keep in mind that Epiphanius is writing against the Ebionites. You know, his book is a heresiology. It's a list of heresies. He considers the Ebionites to be a heresy, and so he's going to portray them in a negative light. So anything that he can say, that he, you know, everything that he says, it's always... You know, they're so-called this, or they're spurious that, they're, you know, they're stupid doctrine of this or that or whatever. So, you know, Epiphanius, he's always going to talk about them in a negative light. So you see here where he's saying that, that they've corrupted the writings of Clement and they lie in their writings and all that stuff. He says that about all these sects because, you know, he's a company man. He's here to stick up for, for the church and to keep people from going into this, you know, whole, you know, Jewish uh, Christian groups. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to point out that uh, when we're talking about the recognitions and the homilies of Clement, that Epiphanius does mention that, the, that they, these documents were actually used by the Nazarenes and the Ebionites. Okay, so what are the doctrines of the Nazarenes? You know, here's one that you don't hear mentioned very often. In fact, it's very, it's very unpopular if you point out that um, the Ebionites and the Nazarenes were vegetarians, but the thing is, over and over and over again, there's these references to these, um, you know, to you, if you want to use the blanket term like you know Jewish Christian groups, a lot of them were vegetarians. Um, we've got numerous rep references that they were vegetarians. Uh, here it is from the Panarion. Uh, Epiphanius says in the travels they have charged everything to suit, changed everything to suit themselves and slandered Peter in many ways, saying that he abstained from flesh and dressed meat as they do, and any other dish made from meat, since the Ebionites entirely abstained from these. Um, in the homilies, we see the same uh, doctrine mentioned. Uh, again, the homilies is an actual Ebionite doctrine, document, or Nazarene document. It says, however, such a choice has occurred to you, perhaps without your understanding or knowing that my manner of life that I, Peter, use only bread and olives and rarely pot herbs, and that this is why my only coat and cloak which I wear, and I have no need of any of them, nor of aught else, for even in these I abound, for my mind, seeing all the eternal good things that are there, regard none of the things that are here. So Keith is, you know, talking about how he lives a simple life, eats only bread and olives and some, some herbs. Again, similar statement in the recognitions. I live on bread alone with olives and sel seldom even with pot herbs. And my dress is what you see, a tunic and a tallit. And having these, I require nothing more. It's recognitions, book 7, verse six, or chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> also, we have this from the homily. It says, Wherefore, as you were deceived by the forerunner Simon, the Simon Magus, and so became dead in your souls to Elohim, and were smitten in your bodies. So now, if you repent, as I said, and submit 
to those things which are well-pleasing to Elohim, you may get new strength to your bodies and recover your soul's health. And the things which are well-pleasing to Elohim are these, to pray to him, to ask from him, recognizing that he is the giver of all things, and gives with discriminating law to abstain from the table of devils, not to taste dead flesh, nor to touch blood, to be washed from all pollution and from the rest in one word, as the Elohim-fearing Jews have heard, do you also hear, and be of one mind in many bodies, let each man be minded to do uh, to his neighbor those good things he wishes for himself. So this is a, a quote from Kepha in the homilies, pointing out that, um, that Yahuwah desires us not to eat dead flesh. I know this is a controversial subject, and of course, um, you know, Paul himself, uh, in a couple of his letters, he, he preaches against vegetarianism. Uh, if you've listened to some other teachings, you'll see that there was a, uh, a division of sorts between uh, James and Paul. And I think that Paul's criticism of vegetarianism uh, stemmed from his, this beef that he had with, with James. You know, he didn't really care for, for James very much. And we'll get into that a little later in this teaching. Um, they also rejected the animal sacrifices. Uh, as the Panarian says, and their so-called gospel says, this is the gospel according to the Hebrews, um, Yeshua is saying that I came to abolish the sacrifices, and if you cease not from sacrifice, wrath will not cease from you. Uh, they also lay down certain ascents and instructions in the, in the supposed ascents of James as though he were giving orders against the temple and the sacrifices and the fire on the altar. Uh, I've got a teaching on my YouTube channel that the name of the teaching is I Came to Abolish Sacrifices. Uh, if you listen to that teaching, it kind of goes into this doctrine that the Nazarenes had that they rejected the animal sacrifices. Uh, you also see this in the recognitions of Clement. It says, uh, um, speak, this is Kepha speaking about uh, him and the apostles are in the temple and they're uh, debating back and forth with the, the priests. Uh, this is the events that led up to the attack where Stephen was stoned. So you can find that, I think, in Acts chapter 7. But Kepha says, Thus we argued and bore witness, and we who were unlearned men and fishermen taught the Kohanim concerning the unified Yahuwah of heaven, that he is much rather displeased with the sacrifices that you offer, the time of sacrificing having now passed away. And because you will not acknowledge that the time for offering victims is now past, Therefore the temple will be destroyed and the abomination of desolation will stand in the devoted place and the besorah will be preached to the goyim for a testimony against you that your unbelief may be judged by their faith. And in the homilies we have the similar statements where uh, uh, Kepha is saying, but he is not pleased with sacrifices it is shown by this that those who lusted after the flesh were slain as soon as they tasted it and were consigned to a tomb so that it was called the grave of lusts. He then, who, was, who, who at the first was displeased with the slaughtering of animals, not wishing them to be slain, did not ordain sacrifices as desiring them, nor from, for the beginning did he uh, require them. So, again, you see this in the homilies where Kepha is saying that the sacrifices were never commanded by Elohim. Uh, again, in my presentation on I came to abolish sacrifices, we go through all the prophets that are in the Tanakh, and we see how they over and over and over again actually repeated this message also, that Yahuwah never ordained the sacrifices, he did not command them, and he was you know, continually telling the children of Israel to quit sacrificing animals in his temple. Uh, many people just read right over that when they read the prophets, and they completely, they completely miss it. But um, I think I go through probably eight or nine different prophets in your Bible that that are telling the children of Israel to stop sacrificing animals. Um, because according to the scriptures, it's something that was, that was added after the fact. Somebody got in and added it to the Torah. Um, they believe that Yeshua is the true prophet that Navi met. Uh, again, you, you have this mentioned in Panarian where it says, they say, however, that Christ is the true prophet. Uh, and then this true prophet doctrine is uh, repeated in the recognitions, where it says, He therefore is the Navi Amet who appeared to us, as you have heard, in Judea, who standing in public places by a simple command made the blind see, the deaf hear, cast out demons, 
restored health to the sick and life to the dead. And since nothing was impossible to him, and it goes on. Um, but again, you see this Navi Ahmed, the true prophet doctrine, mentioned in the recognitions. Uh, the Panarian says, The Ebionites say that Yeshua is from above, created before all things, a spirit both higher than the angels and Lord of all, and that he is called Christ, the heir of the world there. But he comes here when he chooses, as he came in Adam and appeared to the patriarchs clothed with Adam's body. So this, again, um, Epiphanius is trying to make the Nazarenes and the Ebionites sound crazy or to sound like they, you know, they have these weird doctrines. Um, this doctrine is actually not too far off from what most Christians and Messianics believe. Uh, this doctrine he's talking about, about Yeshua appearing um, in Adam's body, there's no, there's no indication that they believe that he appeared in Adam's body to the patriarchs. But what he's talking about is um, the Ebionites believe that it was Yeshua that came and had lunch with Abraham right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that it was Yeshua who was in the pillar of fire by night and the cloud of fire by or, uh, the the cloud of the pillar of cloud by day. That that was Yeshua who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, that's that's what Epiphanius is um, is referring to here. Now they did believe that that Adam had the Holy Spirit of Yeshua within him in the Garden of Eden. So in the same way that you know we have the Holy Spirit now, Adam himself also had the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit was the Spirit of Messiah. You see this referred to in the homilies when, um, where Kepha says, If any one do not allow the man fashioned by the hand of God, i.e. Adam, to have had the Holy Spirit of Christ, how is he not guilty of the greatest impiety? And he goes on from there. Um, Homilies 8.10 says, The only good Elohim, having made all things well, and having handed them over to man, who was made after his image, he who had been made breathing of the divinity of him who made him, being a true prophet and knowing all things. So again, you have this, uh, uh, they, they believe that the spirit of Messiah was actually breathed into Adam when Yahuwah breath, you know, breathed the spirit of life into Adam's body. <clears throat> um... And again, we have uh, in the recognitions, therefore Abraham, when he was desirous to learn the causes of things and was in, intently pondering upon what had been told him, the Navi Amet Yeshua appeared to him. Goes on a little bit and it says that when they were afflicted, Yeshua appeared to Moses and struck Mitzrayim with the ten plagues. Again, this is what a lot of Messianics and Christians believe, that that the angel of Yahuwah that came and, and brought the children of Israel out of Egypt was actually Yeshua, and that's the doctrine which we usually refer to this as a primal Adam doctrine, um, but that's what uh, Epiphanius was referring to. Also, they believe that poverty was a virtue. Uh, Panarian Epiphanius says, They themselves, if you please, boastfully claim that they are poor because they sold their possessions in the apostles' time, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and went over to a life of poverty and renunciation, and thus they say they are called poor by everyone. So that's why the Ebionites are called Ebionites. They're called, you know, Ebion means poor, so they're called the poor. Um, and so you have uh, Epiphanius is admitting that uh, that these Ebionites claim to be the descendants from the original Jerusalem assembly. And, you know, now here in the 4th century, Ebion is, or uh, Epiphanius is calling them a, a heresy. Recognitions, book 7 says, I live on bread alone. And we've already read most of this uh, quote, but it says that, you know, notice my dress is what you see, a tunic with a tallit. Uh, having these, I require nothing more. This is sufficient for me because my mind does not regard things present but things ageless, and therefore no present invisible thing delights me. You know, this is Kepha speaking about his life of poverty. He says, This life of ours, which makes use of necessary things alone, for we, that is, I, my brother um, Adamia, have, it's Andrew, have grown up from our childhood, not only orphans, but also extremely poor. So you see this uh, mention of the... Um, the poverty of the apostles and how they lived a very uh, poor lifestyle. Again, it's reiterated in the homilies. 
Uh, Peter used only bread and olives and rarely pot herbs. And this is my only coat and cloak, which I wear, and I have no need of any of them nor anything else. For even in these I abound for my mind, seeing all the eternal good things that are here, that are there, regard none of the things that are here. So he's basically saying, I'm looking for my reward in the age to come, not this age. <clears throat> uh, they believed, the Ebionites and Nazarenes believed that there was false insertions into the scripture. Uh, the Panarian says, nor do they accept Moses' Pentateuch in its entirety. They reject certain sayings. So basically the idea is, is that the Ebionites and the Nazarenes believed that the Torah had been delivered in its perfect, unadulterated form to Moses. But over time, scribes and um, priests had come in and had inserted extra commands into the Torah so that it became like this huge, you know, um, collection of added commandments. And some of the commandments were against the, the original commandments. So uh, you see this being disputed and debated a lot by Yeshua, where he's um, refuting a lot of these uh, additions made to the Torah. I just put out a presentation yesterday, and the name of the, the presentation is Every Plant Which My Father Has Not Planted, and it goes into Yeshua and what Yeshua says all through the Gospel of Matthew about the false insertions into Scripture. So I would invite you to, to listen to that for more information. But for the scope of this teaching, we're just going to briefly touch on it. Uh, and the recognitions says that when he had said this, he began to expound to me point by point of those chapters of the Torah that seemed to be in question. So this is Clement speaking about Kepha, saying that Kepha was instructing him in certain sections of the Torah that were in question. Uh, the, hem the homilies also... Uh, repeat this same idea. It says, for the scriptures, this is Kepha speaking. Uh, Kepha says, for the scriptures have had joined to them many falsehoods against Elohim on this account. The prophet Moses, having by the order of Elohim delivered the law with the explanations to chosen men, after a little while the written Torah had added to it certain falsehoods contrary to the Torah of Elohim, uh, the wicked one having dared to work this. And it goes on from there. You can find uh, the rest of that in Homilies, Book 2, Chapter 38. The Nazarenes and the Ebionites, they practice daily immersion. Uh, in the travels, they have charged everything to suit themselves and slandered Peter in many ways, saying that he was baptized daily for purification as they are. So, you know, this is, again, this is Epiphanius. He is attempting to teach against the Abionites. So everything that he describes, he's going to describe it as if it was a, a heresy or something you know, crazy or unorthodox. And so that's why he's saying that uh, you know, he's accusing the Nazarenes of slander. So basically, baptism is presented as, as is spoken about by Kepha as in two different ways. Uh, in one respect, it is a, a ritual that you do one time to... to enter into covenant in much the same way that baptism is practiced in the Christian churches today. But once you're baptized into the community, then uh, your, your daily ritual immersion becomes um, kind of like a, a daily thing that you do in the same way that you pray daily. Um, you know, you, you enter into covenant by saying a prayer to Yahuwah, asking Him to, you know, to save you. Um, and then once you say that sinner's prayer, so to speak, then you, um, you will daily pray to Yahuwah. And it's the same thing. Like you, you immerse one time to enter into the faith of Messiah, but then uh, immersion or ritual bathing becomes a daily occurrence. And, um, and incidentally, it's, it, there's a first century document known as the Didache, which is a, a teaching from the apostles that mentions immersion, and it doesn't have to be full immersion. You know, you can, the, the Didache actually says that if you don't have a, a, you know, living water, you can use any water. You could, essentially, when you get your shower in the morning, you could pray for purification from Yahuwah, and that would be um, sufficient to fulfill this daily immersion that the Ebionites practice. So it doesn't have to be you go in every day out to the creek and, dunking yourself completely underwater. You could do that in a shower. Um, if, if we take the, um, the Didache for what it says. 
<clears throat> this is also referred to in the recognitions. It says, when Peter had bathed in the sea and taken food, he went to sleep. The next morning, Kepha took my brothers and me with him. We went down to the harbor to bathe in the sea. So you see this mentioned all through the uh, recognitions and the homilies. Pe Peter is constantly mentioned as going to bathe every morning. Um, so here's another example. Peter uh, blessed them and went out and having bathed in the sea, partook of food with the forerunners. And then evening come, he slept. And Peter, rising and found, finding us awake, saluted us and went out to the reservoir that he might bathe and pray. Um, so you, know, you see this mentioned in the, uh, in the homilies and recognitions. Now, they did accept the Torah, so don't think that just because they disputed certain words, certain sayings in the Torah, that they disputed the Torah itself. Um, the Panarian says that, the, that Ebion adheres to Judaism's law of the Sabbath, circumcision, and all the other Jewish and Samaritan observances. So it's not that they rejected the Torah, it's that they rejected the man-made additions to the Torah. Again, you see this in the homilies. It says, but this matter stands, the only good Elohim, having made all things well and having handed them over to man, show them the way which leads to his friendship, teaching them by what deeds of man, the one Elohim and master of all is pleased, and having exhibited to them the things that are pleasing to him, appointed a perpetual law to all, which neither can be abrogated by enemies, nor is uh, vitiated by any impious one, impious one, nor is concealed in any place, but which can be read by all. So, you know, here they speak about the Elohim given man, the eternal Torah, the uncorrupted Torah. And the recognition says, The decree of Yahuwah that he ordained as an ageless Torah to all, and decreed that a day of judgment should be expected. So, you know, you have that. Uh, plus, and this is the really controversial part, they rejected Paul. Um, I think you can really see evidence of this even in the New Testament where there's this, if you know what to look for, um, Paul is constantly coming against the the Ebionites and the Nazarenes. I mean, he's, I know that Acts makes it seem like uh, Paul was completely, you know, um, in board and, and good to go with the other apostles, but I think that uh, once you start studying some of this information, you'll realize very soon that um, once you realize what the doctrines of the Nazarenes were, you'll realize that Paul is consistently preaching against them and consistently preaching against the twelve apostles in his letters. But that's another story for another day. Um, in the Panarian it says, nor are they ashamed to accuse Paul. They claim that he was a Greek and the son of a Greek mother and a Greek father. Uh, he went up to Jerusalem to stay there for a while, desired to marry the daughter of the high priest, therefore became a proselyte, became circumcised. But since he could not marry that sort of girl, he became angry and wrote against circumcision and against the Sabbath and the legislation. So, you know, keep in mind that Epiphanius, he actually communicates directly with the Ebionites. You know, he lives in the region of Palestine when he's writing this book. And he mentions in his section on the Ebionites, he mentions that he is reading their documents. He's actually you know, speaking to and communicating with actual Ebionites um, who, who reject Paul, who say that Paul was a false apostle. Um, and then again, you have, uh, this is from the, uh, the homilies. This is, a big part of the homilies and the recognitions portrays Kepha debating against Simon Magus. But if you listen to the doctrine that Kepha's arguing against, he's arguing against Pauline doctrine. And in fact, uh, Simon Magus is described very similar to Paul. And I, I think, and many people who read the recognitions and homilies believe that um, that Simon Magus is essentially just a stand-in for Paul. So even though Kepha's debating against Simon Magus, he's really debating against Paul. Um, but uh, the Abionites um, changed Paul's name to Simon Magus in order to kind of uh, conceal what they were saying. So for instance, this, this chapter in the uh, homilies, this is from um, 
17, 19, homily 17, 19, it says, If then our Yeshua appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you, it is as one who was enraged with an adversary. Now, who does that sound like that had a, a vision of Yeshua when Yeshua was enraged against him as an adversary? That kind of sounds like Paul. It says, and this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. But can, any, can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through apparitions? And if you will say it's possible, then I ask, why does our teacher abide in discourse a whole year to those who were awake? And how are we to believe your word when you tell us that he appeared to you? And how did he appear to you when you entertained opinions contrary to his, to his teaching? But if you will seem, but if you were seen and taught by him, and became his apostle, apostle for a single hour, proclaim his utterances, interpret his sayings, love his apostles, and contend not with me who accompanied him. So all of these things that are highlighted in yellow, you know, scholars who read Paul's letters and who who speak Greek and who 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 study every letter of the New Testament. They all say these things. They say that um, that Paul entertains opinions contrary to the teachings of Yeshua, and uh, you know a lot of them just say, "Well, you know, I guess after the resurrection, Yeshua had a different doctrine." But I would say I think that Paul was teaching something that Yeshua never taught. So um, goes on, this is the same chapter, it says, For in direct opposition to me, who am a firm rock, the foundation of the assembly, you now stand. If you were not opposed to me, you would not accuse me. Now, who was it that was, that was opposing Kepha to his face in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians? Of course, that was Paul. And revile the truth proclaimed by me, in order that I may not be believed when I state what I myself have heard from my own ears from the Master, as if I were evidently a person that was condemned and in bad repute. But if you say that I am not that I am condemned, you bring an accusation against Elohim, who revealed the Messiah to me, and you inveigh against him who pronounced me blessed on account of the revelation. But if indeed you really wish to work in the cause of truth, first learn from all of us what we have learned from him, and becoming a disciple of the truth, become a fellow worker with us. So that's from the homilies. Again, a lot of the uh, a lot of the things mentioned by Kepha in this document is it seems to be an anti-Paul kind of stance. Um, recognition 7, 71 through 72, it says there ensued a tumult on every side, the beating and the beaten, this is taking place in the temple. Uh, this is the same instance that uh, led up to the stoning of Stephen. It said much blood is shed, there's a confused flight in the midst of which that enemy that enemy being Paul, attacked ja uh, Yaakov, threw him headlong from the top of the steps, and supposing him to be dead, he cared not to inflict further violence upon him. Then after three days, one of the brothers came to us from Gamaliel, who we mentioned before, bringing to us secret tidings that that enemy had received commission from Caiaphas, the Kohen Haggadol, that he should arrest all who believed in Yeshua and should go to Damascus with his letters, and that there also employed the help of the unbelievers, he should make havoc, among the faithful, and that he was hastening to Damascus chiefly on this account, because he believed Kepha had fled thither. So, in the book of Acts, you know, Paul is kind of like this, this uh, bystander when Stephen was stoned. Now, in the recognitions of Clement, Paul is not a bystander, but he is the leader of the, of the attack against the Nazarenes. And not only that, he attempted to murder James in the, in the midst of this uh, riot that that Paul started. Uh, it's a very much a, a different impression of Paul than what we get from the book of Acts. Uh, this is, again, this is a letter of Peter to James. It's a, another one of these Nazarene documents that we still have access to. And so Peter is writing to James and says, Give the scroll of my preachings to our brethren with the like mystery of initiation, for if it be not so done, our word of truth will be rent into many opinions. And this I know, as already seen in the beginning of this very evil, for some from among the Goyim have rejected my Torah observant preaching, uh, attaching themselves to certain Torahless and trifling preachings of the man who is my enemy. All through the Nazarene writings, Paul is referred to as the enemy. So again, I think this is a reference to Paul. 
It says, And these things some have attempted while I'm still alive to transform our words by certain uh, various interpretations in order to bring about the dissolution of the Torah, as though I also myself were of such a mind, but did not freely proclaim it, which Yahuwah forbid. Okay, so those are some of the doctrines of the, um, of the Nazarene. So when you hear somebody, you know, claiming to be a Nazarene, that, that they're, you know, a part of the original Yeshua movement, um, show them this video and ask them, okay, if you're a Nazarene, do you support all these, all of these uh, ideologies? Because this is essentially what a Nazarene is. I am a Nazarene. I do um, follow these theologies. I believe these theologies are correct. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff is, is things that you probably never heard before, but when I go back and look at the New Testament after reading these Nazarene writings, suddenly I realize that a lot of this stuff, a lot of these beliefs are referred to and alluded to in the New, New Testament. Um, I just think that someone's done a little bit of redaction to try and hide some of these doctrines, but uh, once you know what to look for, you'll notice that, um, that these are the same things that Yeshua is teaching. So, thanks for listening. I thank you for taking the time to listen to me and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you and Shalom.